How is money created? Where does it come from? Who benefits? And what purpose does it serve? What is a money system? What is the money behind the money system? For centuries, the mechanics of the monetary system have remained hidden from the prying eyes of the populace. Yet its impact, both on a national and international level, is perhaps unsurpassed. For it is the monetary system that provides the foundations for international dominance and national control. Today, as these very foundations are being shaken by crises, the need for open and honest dialogue on the future of the monetary system has never been greater. This economic crisis is like a cancer. If you just wait and wait thinking this is going to go away, just like a cancer is going to grow and it's going to be too late. What I would say to everybody is get prepared. Uh, this is not a time right now to uh, wishful thinking the government is going to sort things out. The governments don't rule the world. Goldman Sachs rules the world. We're on the verge of a perfect storm. In opposition lie corrupt and entrenched interests that lurk in the corridors of power, for whom there are no reasons to relinquish privileges they feel are justly deserved. Has he got, has he got a reform plan for the NHS? No. Has he got a police reform plan? Has he got a plan to cut the deficit? Do you trust the government? Order. Try to calm down and behave like an adult. And if you can't, if it's beyond you, leave the chamber, get out, we'll manage without you. This is the bank to be put out of its feeding station. There's no coincidence that boom and bust started to become a real cyclical issue around about the 1700s um, when William Patterson founded the Bank of England. This is intolerable behaviour as far as the public... No, it's not funny. <laughs> Only in your mind is it funny. It's not funny at all. It's disgraceful. The system is inherently unstable as a result of the international power it provides to the dominant parties. For at the heart of it lies the idea of how can I get something for nothing? Statistical analysis has found that every time an empire begins to near its own demise, you'll find that its currency will be debased. There is no guide to how this whole system operates. Uh, to give you an example, a researcher at the BBC working on a Robert Peston documentary went to the Bank of England and said, can you give me a, you know, a, a guide to how money is created? And they just said, no. This documentary will investigate and explain this ever-changing system and the impact it has, both on a national and international level. In 2010, the total UK money supply stood at £2.15 trillion. 2.6% of this total was physical cash, £53.5 billion. The rest, £2.1 trillion, or 97.4% of the total money supply, was commercial bank money. The 3% of money um, is created uh, through the central bank and that money essentially, if you created a £10 note, you could sell that to a bank to put into their ATM and the bank would have to repay that £10 or buy it for £10. There'd be no interest may, uh, charged on that money, but that money is then essentially transferred to the Treasury and it's a, it's a, it's a form of fundraising um, for the government. It's called Sinaraj.
when the Bank of England creates a £10 note, it costs it about three or four pence to actually print that note. And it sells it to the high street banks at face value, so at £10. And the profit, the difference between printing the note and actually selling it for £10, goes directly to the treasury. So in effect, all the profit that we get on creating physical money, uh, banknotes, goes to the treasury and it reduces how much taxes we have to pay. Um, over the last 10 years that's raised about 18 billion pounds. In 1948, notes and coins constituted 17% of the total money supply. This was one contributing factor in the government's ability to finance post-war reconstruction. This included the establishment of the NHS. In only 60 years, notes and coins have shrunk to less than 3%. Prior to 1844, bank notes were created by private banks and the government did not profit from their creation. Pre-industrialisation, there was multiple forms of money coexisting. And so the kind of rise of, kind of, of government-sponsored fiat money is a relatively recent um, phenomenon. In the 1840s, there was no law to stop banks from creating their own bank notes. So they used to issue um, paper notes as, as kind of a, a representative of what you had in the bank account. Instead of you taking your heavy metal coins out of the bank and then going and paying somebody with them, you could get your paper which said how much money you had in the bank and you could give that to somebody and they could use that to go and get the heavy metal coins from the bank. Now over time these paper notes became as good as money. People would use the paper notes instead of going and getting the real money from the bank. And obviously as soon as the banks realised that what they were creating had become you know, the dominant type of money in the economy, they realised that by, by creating more of it, they could generate profits. You know, they can just print up some new notes, lend it, and get the interest on top of that. And they did that you know, up until the 1840s. In the 1840s, they pushed it just a little bit too far, and that caused inflation, it destabilised the economy. So in 1844, the Conservative government of Robert Peel actually passed a law that took the power to create money away from the commercial banks um, and brought it back to the state. So since then the Bank of England has been the only organisation authorised to, to create paper notes. Since then everything's gone digital and what we now use as money is the digital numbers that commercial banks can create out of nothing. The problem was that they did not include in that, in that legislation um, the deposits, the demand deposits um, held in banks by individuals or um, electronic forms of money which essentially what those demand deposits are today. <clears throat> Most of the money in circulation is, is electronic money um, and it's bank, it's bank um, demand deposits um, that just that, that sit in our, in our account. So in a way the legislation has got needs to catch up with developments in, in, in electronic money uh, uh, and the way that banks actually operate. Money held in bank accounts are called demand deposits. This is an accounting term the banks use when they create credit. Banks follow the same process when they create loans. All money held in bank accounts is an accounting entry. The reality is now that most money is not paper and it's not metal coins, it's digital. It's just numbers in a computer system, you know, it's your Visa debit card, it's your electronic, you know, ATM card. Um, it's this, it's plastic, you know, it's numbers in a computer system. You move money from one computer system to another, it's all a big database. And this digital money is what we're now using to make payments with, it's what we actually use to run the economy. I think a lot of people in the UK probably think that the government or the central bank um, is, is in control of most, most money in circulation and issues new money into circulation, but that's uh, not the case. It's private banks that create the vast majority of new money in circulation and also decide uh, how it's allocated. 
The official terminology for this accounting entry is commercial bank money. When banks issue loans to the public, they create new commercial bank money. When a customer repays a loan, commercial bank money is destroyed. The banks keep the interest as profit. There's a lot of misconceptions about the way banks work. There was a, a poll done by the Cobden Centre where they asked people you know, how, how they thought banks actually operated. Around 30% of the public think that when you put your money into the bank, it just stays there and it's safe. And you can understand why, because you know, every, every child has a piggy bank where you keep putting money in, and then when it's a rainy day, you smash it and you take that money out and you spend it. So a lot of people f keep this, this idea of banking, you know, it's somewhere safe to keep your money so that it's there for whenever you need it. Um, another, the other 60% of people assume that when you put your money in, that money's then being m moved across to somebody who wants to borrow it. So you have a pensioner who keeps saving money of her entire life, and then her life savings have been lent to some you know, young people who want to buy a house. But actually, banks don't work like that. At the moment in the UK, money creation uh, and control is, is largely in the hands of private banks. Uh, about 97 to 98% of money um, that's, that's created is, is created um, as bank, bank debt money, you could call it, um, when banks issue money into circulation as, as loans, essentially. Um, this is a very poorly understood fact. It's not a conspiracy theory, it's not a... Um it's not a crackpot theory, it's the way the Bank of England describes the process. When banks make loans, they create new money. A few economists will realise the way the money system works, but if you don't, if you don't realise the way that money works and you think that you know, everybody's saving is going to work well for the economy. What really happens, once you understand the way the money system works, is that if everybody starts saving, uh, the amount of money in the economy shrinks and we have a recession. So most economists don't have this, this full picture. They don't understand all elements of the system. They rely on uh, assumptions, on, you know, received knowledge, without actually going into the details. And you know, money is money is the centre of the economy. If you don't understand where it comes from, who it creates, who creates it, and when it gets created, then how can you understand the entire economy? When the vast majority of money that we use now is not cash, but it's electronic money, then whoever's creating the electronic money is getting the proceeds of creating that money. And obviously creating electronic money is much more profitable than creating cash because you don't have any production costs at all. So while we've got 18 billion over the course of a decade in profit from creating cash, the banks have actually created 1.2 trillion pounds. Between 1998 and 2007, the UK money supply tripled 1.2 trillion pounds was created by banks, whilst 18 billion pounds was created by the Treasury. A lot of people think when I say this, or when you say this, or when Positive Money say this, that we're all just a bunch of nutters. But on the 9th of March in 2009, the Governor of the Federal Reserve, um, Ben Bernanke, gave the first ever broadcast interview the Governor of the Central Bank of the United States of America had ever given. And uh, the day before that, he'd bailed out AIG, um, uh, which is an insurance company, not even a bank, actually, to the tune of about $160 billion. So the journalist says to him, now, Mr. Bernanke, where did you get $160 billion to bail out AIG? Is that tax money that the Fed is spending? It's not tax money. The banks have um, accounts with the Fed much the same way that you have an account in a commercial bank. So to lend to a bank, we simply use the computer to mark up the uh, size of the account that they have with the Fed. So it's much more akin, uh, although not exactly the same, but it's much more akin to printing money than it is to borrowing. 
banks create new money whenever they extend credit, buy existing assets, or make payments on their own account, which mostly involves expanding their assets. When a bank buys securities, such as a corporate or government bond, it adds the bond to its assets and increases the company's bank deposits by the corresponding amount. New commercial bank money enters circulation when people spend the credit that has been granted to them by banks. I found that talking on the doorstep from August last year round to no, August 2009 round to the general election, what, eight, nine, eight, nine months, I suppose, knocking on doors, is that when you try to explain how the money system works, there's uh, an almost inbuilt refusal of people to accept that such a bizarre situation could actually uh, exist. No, it can't possibly, you know. What do you mean? It can't, bank, banks can't, the banks don't create money out of thin air. That's ridiculous, they can't do that. They lend out their depositors' money. Most people have an idea of, of how money is. They're used to their own way of handling money. Uh, and they try and implement their own idea of how, how their small household economy works into the national economy. And of course, it just doesn't work out. It just doesn't work out at all. By 2008, the outstanding loan portfolio of bank-created credit, also known as commercial bank money, stood at over two trillion pounds. As recently as 1982, the ratio of notes and coins to bank deposits was 1 to 12. By 2010, the ratio had risen to 1 to 37. That is, for every pound of treasury-created money, there was 37 pounds of bank-created money. In the 10 years prior to the 2007 crisis, the UK commercial bank money supply expanded by between 7 to 10% every year. A growth rate of 7% is the equivalent of doubling the money supply every 10 years. The amount of money they're creating out of nothing is just incredible. 1.2 trillion in the last 10 years. Um, and there's, that money is being distributed according to the priorities of the banking sector, you know, not the priorities of society. Bank sector itself grew from 1980 2.5 trillion dollars to 40 trillion dollars by assets. In 1980, global bank assets were worth 20 times the then global economy. By 2006, they were worth 75 times, according to the UN. As the following chart shows, total bank assets of UK banks as a percentage of GDP remain relatively stable at 50 to 60% up to the end of the 1960s. After that, they shot up dramatically. And the real money in, in the world uh, to be made today is not by producing anything at all, it's simply by forms of speculating, basically making money from money. Uh, that's the most profitable and, and by far and away um, the, the biggest form of, of, of activity, of economic activity that exists in the world today. Today, Banks are no longer restricted by how much they can lend and, as such, how much new credit they can create out of nothing. They are restricted solely by their own willingness to lend. The issue with allowing banks to create money, uh, there's two main issues. Firstly, the fact that they create this money when they make loans. So it guarantees that you know, we have to borrow all our money for the economy from the banks. As such, to have a healthy growing economy, the government needs to put in place strategies to allow for ever-increasing debt. The only way the government can create additional purchasing power is by getting itself and us into more debt. The second big issue with allowing banks to create money is that they have the incentive to always create more. You know, they create more money if they issue a loan they get the bonuses and the commissions and the incentives to create, you know, to lend as much as possible. You have to develop a sales culture. What did they do? They recruited an amazing guy, lovely guy, Andy Hornby, who came from Asda, to turn the bank into a supermarket retailing operation. If you trust bankers to control the money supply, the money supply will just grow and grow and grow, as will the level of debt. 
until the point where it crashes, you know, when some people can't repay the debt. And then they'll stop lending. You hear politicians and journalists saying, you know, we've, we've been living beyond our means, we've become dependent on debt, we need to rein in our spending and live within our means. Um, it's not possible in the current system. You know, the reason why everybody's in debt now is not because they've been recklessly borrowing. Um, we haven't borrowed all this money from, you know, an army of pensioners who've been saving up their whole, whole lives. Money in the current system is debt. You know, it's created when banks make loans. So the only way in the current system that we can have any money in the economy, you know, the only way we can have money for business to trade is if we've borrowed it all from the banks. And it's the very opposite of what the Tory party is arguing today, which is that you have to create savings before you can help the National Health Service. And it's because economists have completely confused those things, both in monetary policy terms, but also in economic thinking, and because most people still harbour the, the old-fashioned view that you need savings before you can invest, that we have the mess that we're in today. Now, one of the reasons why we find it difficult to understand the banking system and credit creation is that we leave school without any money and we go and get a job working as an apprentice to a plumber. We work really hard all month and at the end of the month somebody puts money in our bank and so for us the logic is you work and then you get money, you get savings. In reality you would never have got that job if credit hadn't been created in the first instance. It's a really important um, conceptual misunderstanding and it isn't something that the public just are guilty of. Economists don't understand this stuff. Money doesn't come out of economic activity. A lot of people I've come across as kind of assume that if you've got people, if you've got businesses and you've got people doing things that somehow money somehow emerges out of the process of people doing things, doing economic, making things and growing things and selling things and producing things, that somehow money just emerges it's not, it's like oil in the car, you have to put it in. When I see David Cameron talking about how um, we need an economy not based on debt, but we need an economy based on savings, he just doesn't know what he's saying. It's ridiculous, it's absolutely absurd, and it shows his complete lack of understanding of how our money system actually works. What he's essentially saying is that we need an economy with no money. If everyone was saving, we'd have mass disappearing of money, which is essentially what a bank write-off is, essentially, is people defaulting on their debt, which, which essentially is just money disappearing. But if people weren't taking on the debt, then it's just, it's just such a joke, it's such an amateur understanding of how our economy works and how the monetary system works and how money is actually created. So um, I really do get a laugh out of watching what people are actually saying, and they're all just regurgitating what they've learned off each other and you just hear the same things and it just makes me it, it really gets on my nerves when I hear people talking about um, yeah we need more regulations we need to regulate the way banks are actually and the bonus it's all just one big smokescreen and working on all the symptoms of a greater disease which is really you need to look at the the money system the way money is created and uh, if we don't want any debt, then we're essentially saying we don't want any money and we want a moneyless economy with the exception of the 3% that's created debt free. You know, it's a paradox under the current system. If, you, if we as the public go into further debt, then that's going to put more money into the economy and we're going to have a boom. When you have a boom, it's easier to borrow so people get into even more debt. And eventually, you know, this, this cycle continues, it gets easier and easier to get into debt until some people get over in debt and then you know they default they can't repay their mortgage that's what happened in you know it happened first in subprime america um, and then you know that just brings through a wave of defaults which will ripple across the entire economy the banks go insolvent then we're into a financial crisis um, and then the banks stop lending and you know the, they were excessively lending in the boom and then they stop lending and then that court makes the recession even worse People lose their jobs and then they become even more dependent on debt just to survive, basically. You know, we have a, a system where we have to borrow in order to have an economy. We have to be in debt to the banks. And that, that guarantees, you know, a massive profit for the banks. This is the boom-bust cycle. 
And I have said before, Mr. Deputy Speaker, no return to boom and bust. Net bank lending must forever increase. We're paying interest on every single pound, even if, even if you think the money belongs to you. Somebody somewhere is paying interest on that money. The banking system has such a huge impact on the world, but only because it supplies our nation's money supply. We have to protect them, we have to subsidise them, we have to allow them to continue because the, the disaster of, of a, a bank collapse affects us all in a huge way. And anyone that says that we shouldn't have bailed out the banks doesn't quite understand the, the, the nature of our monetary system. That's like eliminating a, a huge chunk of our money. But also, bailing out the banks is perpetuating a system which is never going to work anyway. So whatever we do, we're always going to have this cycle until we separate how money is created and the activities of banking. Then the banks can do as they wish. They're a normal business like everyone else. There's a, a major democratic issue here as well. I mean, you have these private profit-seeking banks creating up to 200 billion pounds a year and pumping that into the economy wherever they want, basically, wherever it suits them. Whether they're pumping it into you know, these toxic deri derivatives or putting money into housing bubbles, just making housing more expensive. 200 billion pounds in 2007 of new money coming into the economy created out of nothing. And where that gets spent determines you know, the shape of our economy, effectively. So if we're going to allow anybody to create new money out of nothing, then we should at least have some democratic control over how that money is used. I mean, it, it, would we rather have had that money used for healthcare, you know, to deal with some of the environmental issues, to reduce poverty, or would we rather have it to make houses more expensive so that none of us can afford to, to live in a house? You can see it as a subsidy, a special super subsidy, to the banks for the right to create money which should be for the benefit of the public and spent through a democratic process. There's also another form of money which is effectively an electronic version of cash and it's a type of money that the commercial banks use themselves to make payments between each other. The high street banks don't want to be carrying around huge quantities of money because it's dangerous and it's inconvenient and it's you know, expensive. You have to hire security guards for that type of money. So what they do is they pay each other in what is an electronic version of cash, um, which in the industry is known as central bank reserves. Um, they keep this electronic cash in accounts at the Bank of England. But as a member of the public, you can't access this electronic cash. You can't get it, an account with the Bank of England. What they do is they, they effectively sell this central bank money to the banks. And they do this by creating it out of nothing and using this money to pay for bonds, to buy bonds from the high street banks. So the high street bank will come along with a bond which is you know, effectively government debt. And it will give it to the Bank of England and in return the Bank of England will type some new numbers into the bank's account at the Bank of England. So effectively they're creating central bank reserves out of nothing. The Bank of England creates central bank reserves by increasing the available credit in the settlement bank's account with the Bank of England. The settlement bank in return posts bonds or sells assets as collateral for the reserves. A total of 46 banks hold central reserve accounts at the Bank of England Smaller, or foreign banks, hold accounts with one of these 46 banks to allow them to accept or make payments in pounds sterling. Prior to March 2009, the Bank of England would ask each of the major settlement banks how much reserve currency they needed. The settlement banks would then swap a bond for the reserve currency and agree to repurchase the bond for a specific amount at a specified future date. The settlement banks would then receive interest at base or policy rate for the central bank reserves they held. Since the crisis, settlement bank central reserves have shot up dramatically.
when bank customers transfer funds from their account to another person's account. A process called intraday clearing occurs. The amount of central reserve currency Bank A has at the Bank of England is reduced by the corresponding amount that Bank B receives. This is the importance of central reserve currency to banks. Before the credit crisis, if a bank was short of central reserves at the Bank of England to meet its obligations, then the bank would have to loan reserves from other banks with interest. If you sell something on eBay, you know that that deal's not complete until you get some money put into your account. You know, most people actually want to see the money in their account before they're happy to close on a deal. Now, the banks are pretty much the same, but they want to see the money in their account at the Bank of England before they consider a deal complete. So, for example, if, you, if you're buying a house from somebody who banks with a different bank, then what, what will happen after you spend a quarter of a million on a house is you'll tell your bank to transfer some money to the house seller's bank. And what the bank will do is actually instruct the Bank of England to move 250,000 from their account at the Bank of England to the bank of the house seller. And that money will actually move across between the accounts at the Bank of England. Um, when that money's moved across, then the banks will consider that that payment has been made, you know, it's been settled. Um, they don't really deal in the kind of money that we have in our accounts, they deal in this special money that can only be used at the central bank. There are millions of people across the country, all transferring money to each other, using only a few major banks. These banks can keep a tally on their computer systems, and usually many of the movements cancel each other out at the end of the day. The five major banks, RBS, Lloyds, HSBC, Barclays and Santander hold over 85% of all deposits. As there are a limited number of banks in the system, the central reserve money can only be moved around them in a closed loop. The money is just circulating through the system over and over again. And if you think about it, a one pound coin could be used to make a billion pounds of payments if it was circulated a billion times. And that's effectively the system that you have now, is you have a small pool of real money that's just going round and round the system, and it's been used to make a, a huge quantity of payments on our behalf. Just before the crisis, there was only £20 billion in the accounts at the central bank. September 2007, thousands of Northern Rock customers queue up to withdraw their cash. The company had been forced to seek emergency funding, it's the first run on a British bank in 140 years. If they don't have enough of this central bank money, then effectively they can't make payments. And if that happens, then pretty quickly the entire system seizes up. So the Bank of England has the responsibility of making sure there's enough of this money in the system. The requirements for banks to hold a specific amount of reserves has changed many times since 1947. At that time, banks needed to hold a minimum ratio of 32% of reserves, cash or treasury bonds to deposits. In 2006, the corridor system was introduced in which banks could set their own reserve targets each month. The rules changed again in March 2009, when the Bank of England introduced quantitative easing. Quantitative easing, in effect, gives settlement banks the central reserve currency for free. The central reserve currency is what is referred to as the real money in the fractional reserve model. But the fact is, banks can have as much of this as they want, and central reserve currency itself is a form of fiat money, which is backed by nothing. As a consequence, there is no longer a meaningful fractional reserve. 